um, growing up here in Michigan, one of our um, summer vacation activities was always going to uh, Grand Haven, South Haven, uh, Muskegon, and going fishing on the piers. So it was always um, interesting to see the kind of fish that people were pulling out of the waters. And as a young child, you know, salmon look humongous. And then when you get older and you realize that, wow, there are actual uh, lake monster reports of things much bigger in our Great Lakes, um, that's really eye-opening. So I always divide our lake monster sightings, um, whether they're modern or historical, into five different categories. Now, the first category is giant fish species. So up in Lake Superior, there is the legend of the giant sturgeon. And it's said that the giant sturgeon, whenever it gets angry and starts flicking its tail around, that's when it stirs up these big storms. And it's been known to dent the hulls of, of ships, whether they're wooden or they're, they're metal. And it's known to, to have caused lots, of, lots and lots of chaos. But there's also a couple of giant fish reports from down in the Lake Erie area where people have reported um, sturgeon that are bigger than their boats and have scales, um, you know, fish with scales about the size of a silver dollar. Now, I know um, many people saw the report a couple of weeks ago of the six foot um, long uh, sturgeon that was pulled out of the Detroit River. Now that fish was an estimated 200 years old, female, so she's probably in her prime of breeding. So they did release her back in. But imagine a six foot, you know, long fish like that. Um, she probably will never be caught again. Uh, the, the interesting thing about sturgeons is they have a very bony jaw and it's hard to hook into them. So, and once they've been hooked, they kind of learn their lesson. So they, they don't want to be caught ever again. So she's probably um, going to go live out the rest of her life, um, you know, without any human uh, interference. Um, now that she's learned what hooks are and, and what humans are, and we'll probably never see her again. But uh, she was an amazing find um, for the, the biologist who pulled her up. So, you know, these giant um, fish reports, um, with that comes the reports that I see um, bouncing around the internet, Facebook, um, you know, I see these reports all the time, and that's of sharks swimming in our Great Lakes. Now, unfortunately, uh, the only shark that is capable of this is the bull shark, and they do not tolerate cold water temperatures very well. So in order for this shark to actually live in the Great Lakes, it would have to come into the lakes about the end of July and then leave at the end of August because August is our warmest month. The only problem with this is that there are locks and dams all along the uh, Mississippi River, the Illinois River, and the St. Lawrence Causeway that block and, and uh, actually restrict how fish can move in and out of our Great Lakes. And this was done uh, a long time ago when the silver carp were introduced. And um, the silver carp are these fish that you see as a boat's going down the river, these fish are just exploding out of the water. And that's what they do when they panic. They, they jump out of the water, but they've been known to knock people unconscious because you're getting hit with a 55 pound fish. Uh, that's pretty big, especially for it to go aerodynamic um, out of the water. You really don't expect to see that. And when you get uh, hit with a fish like that, it, it's very detrimental. So there has been a lot of work put in place to restrict these silver carp from going into our Great Lakes. Not because they're going to eat our sports fish, um, the minnows or the fry, but because they eat the habitat that the fry live in. So once they get into the Great Lakes, that's going to be very detrimental for the sports fishing in industry. But back to the, the shark reports that we get in the Great Lakes, there is one actual report and it comes from the Chicago area. Back in 1955, a young man was 
swimming um, off of Chicago Beach. Eyewitnesses say they saw a dorsal fin raise up out of the water. The young man's leg was bitten. Rescuers went out and retrieved him, took him to the hospital where he received treatment for his injuries, and the shark was never caught. So the only issue with this is the fact that I have done a lot of research and I have contacted the hospitals um, in Chicago area uh, because it doesn't say what hospital he was taken to. And none of the hospitals have ever given back a report of yes, um, there was a shark attack victim who was brought in in 1955. Um, you know, and verified it. Now, some hospitals might be closed that were, you know, operating at that time. Um, so there's no way to actually trace down that medical record. But the chances of it actually being a bull shark swimming in our Great Lakes are probably very, very tiny. Um, this is about the time that the locks and dams were put into place and would re have restricted that. Now, we do know that in the Illinois River, before it empties into uh, Lake Michigan, some crab fishermen, some um, trap fishermen actually did catch a small bull shark in their nets. There's actually a picture on the internet of it. Um, and it said that the shark was going along and, and destroying their nets and their, their traps. Um, this one, I, I kind of wonder if it was actually doing any damage because as we've seen with um, uh, marine um, uh, creatures, sharks, dolphins, sea turtles, um, all those things. When, when something gets whales, when they get caught up in a net, the net really starts to weigh them down. And after a while, it just becomes too much of a struggle for them to move. And usually they die and the, the nets drag them to the bottom. Um, so I don't know if it was actually destroying the, the nets or if they were just trying to get some insurance money. Um, either is possible, but there is a picture of these gentlemen with a small bull shark that they claim was damaging their nets. So that is the first category of lake monsters that I like to talk about in my presentations. And that's the giant fish being, whether it's sturgeon or sharks or just a really big fish that... Um, you know, people might be seeing in our in our Great Lakes, um, that's category one. Now, the second category is what I refer to as giant turtles. And we actually have two different gi giant turtle reports off of Lake Michigan. Now, it should be noted that in the historical fossil records, there is a species called Archelon, which was an aquatic marine turtle. Now, this turtle was bigger than a Volkswagen bug. It weighed almost 5,000 pounds from flipper tip to flipper tip. It was 13 feet and from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail, 15 foot. So this was a very sizable turtle, uh, much bigger than what we see in the waters, you know, swimming on the coastlines today. But it was possible for a aquatic species like this to somehow make its way into um, the Great Lakes areas back during the prehistoric times when we actually had inland seas and waterways that ran from the Gulf of New Mexico all the way up to British Columbia and kind of expanded out towards the Great Lakes area through the St. Lawrence River uh, way and then would go back out into the ocean. So there was the possibility of these very large aquatic species um, of turtle to actually get into our Great Lakes system. But the two reports that we have in the Lake Michigan area, the first one is the Stearns Bayou Monster. Now this creature from the descriptions that have been collected over the years, my belief is this is some type of bioluminescent freshwater soft shelled turtle, but of immense size. Um, they say that it has a head like a hippopotamus, which, you know, some of the, uh, you know, more saltwater um, sea turtles do have a head that's similar to a, a um, hippopotamus, but the soft-shelled turtles, they have, they have a longer nose, and this is what lets them 
uh, stay kind of covered in the muck and they can raise their head up and their nose can breathe out of the water, but they can stay, stay like this for a very period, long period of time. Now the Stearns Bayou monster, um, the interesting report of it was, it was about the size and length of a canoe, um, think Volkswagen you know, bug again, or beetle, um, but bioluminescence. So we really don't have anything in the freshwater Great Lakes that is actually bioluminescence. Um, we're seeing this in uh, different types of cephalopods like squids and octopus. We, there are some sharks um, that are actually bioluminescent. There's all kinds of saltwater marine creatures that are bioluminescent, but freshwater, this is a new, interesting, you know, possibility. So the report goes that the family that was staying at the Stearns Bayou um, was vacationing there. This was back when um, the, the coastlines of Michigan were very much vacation spots because of the cool air coming in off the lakes. And there were great um, retreats during the hot summer days. And so this family was vacationing there for, for a few weeks. And on one night, the father, who was actually a doctor, went out to sit on the front porch to get some cool, fresh air. And as he's sitting there, he hears a, a monstrosity of some kind coming up the Stearns Bayou waterway. And he's thinking it's probably some fishermen who are drunk or just being loud and, and obnoxious. But what he sees is something totally different. And it's this, this actual turtle species that is swimming um, with its flippers up into the waterway. And it's so big, it's making so much noise. And he's just sitting there in just stunned amazement watching this creature pass by. But he could see a light emanating from the bottom of it. So this was the first occasion that he witnessed it. And then not even a month later, the creature is witnessed once again by the very same family. And so this time though, as, as one of the family members is sitting outside, they observe that it goes up onto the beach across from where the cottage is that they're staying and is digging a hole and assumedly laying eggs in to the sand. This takes quite a long time, almost the whole night. And so by almost early morning, the, the turtle is making its way down the beach back out uh, into the waterway of, of Stearns Bayou and then who knows where from there. So once they thought the, the, the you know, creature, the turtle had, you know, gone away, this is when they, they row over to the other beach. They go and they find the area that, you know, the, the turtle had dug the hole and they find one large pumpkin sized egg and it was apparently yellow with purple spots very leathery so they very carefully put it in the boat and took it back to the cabin and then that night in town there was a, a ice cream social going on so they were going to take the egg with them and see if any of the more educated people in town could give a a idea of what turtle species this might be now, unfortunately, as they were crossing the bridge to go into town, which was over a large river, the, the wagon was hitting some bumps and the person holding onto the egg lost uh, control of it, couldn't hold onto it, and it plopped out of their arms and into the river and is lost to history. So we will really never know um, what species of turtle this was, if there's more of them in the lake and they have just become better at you know, evading human detection, um, we will never know this because the egg was lost and uh, there have not been any more sightings of that turtle in the Stearns Bayou area. Now moving up the coast of Lake Michigan, um, towards the top of the mitten, uh, we have not quite to the top, but we have the Lake Leelanau area, which is a man-made lake. Um, I'm sure everybody is familiar with these man-made lakes and what I call the zombie trees. Um, these trees that still remain standing in the, the water, even though um, the, you know, the water's filled in the area and you just have these zombie trees 
sitting there. So the story goes that this gentleman, um, young man, decided he would go out in his rowboat and he would go perch fishing in Lake Lelona. And he didn't have an anchor for the boat. So what he thought the next best thing to do was, seeing as he wanted to kind of stay in one location, he would row up to one of these zombie trees and he would tie his rowboat up to the tree and then he could just sit there for as long as he wanted and fish for perch. So he rose up to what he is thinking is just one of these trees with its root formation. And as he gets up next to it and he's, he's tying his, his boat up to it, the rowboat is gently budding against what he assumes is the tree or the tree's roots until a large head and neck raises up out of the water and is pretty much the head of this creature is level with his head. And at this moment, he is just in pure fear. He pulls the rope back and kind of drops down into the boat and starts rolling away. As he's going one way, the large turtle is going a different way and they part company. And it said that he never ever goes perch fishing in Lake Leelana ever again. And people to this day um, are not sure uh, if the trees are, are actually stuck in the mud or if they are just attached to a turtle shell and they move location here, you know, every once in a while to different parts of the lake to, um, you know, find better things to eat. So that's my second category of lake monsters here in the Great Lakes. Now, our third category is actually sea serpents. And when I say sea serpents, this is the, you know, classic interpretation of a giant, you know, snake-like creature in the water um, that's able to undulate through the water and um, you know, some descriptions say it's eight foot, some say it's 88 foot, um, anything from, you know, a, a thickness of a, a telephone pole up to the thickness of a whiskey barrel, which is actually a little bit larger and, and wider in circumference than a telephone pole. Um, color variations from black to green to purple. Um, sometimes with uh, rows of fins going down the back, sometimes with long whiskers. We do know that going through the Straits of Mackinac, where Lake Michigan and Lake Huron join, they're actually one body of water, but because they're on each side of the state of Michigan, um, you know, one's Lake Michigan, one's Lake Huron. But up at the Straits of Mackinac, we actually do have a report where a sheriff's deputy was contacted and called to come investigate sightings of these sea serpents. And he gets to the location, he does observe them from the shoreline, swimming in, you know, in and around the area. And so he actually commandeers a, a boat and attempts to go out to investigate closer to see what they actually are. Unfortunately, he's only able to ever get about 20 feet away from them. And then they dive under the water and they swim off and he can never actually, you know, catch up with them. I will say that we have a lot more sea serpent reports in Lake Huron um, from the lake, the Straits of Mackinac all the way down um, to the, the bottom of uh, the Detroit River. And for some reason, they seem to prefer this fast moving water area. Um, don't really know why. But we get a lot more reports of sea serpent type activity in Lake Huron area. And uh, not just any you know, particular place, um, but the whole lake itself seems to have a lot of sea serpent reports. And um, these coming from all the way back in the 1700s to present day of uh, people seeing these large telephone pole sized um, creatures swimming through the water and um, not knowing quite what they are other than to call them sea serpents. So that's our third category. Now our fourth category is one that I really, really love. Um, it's our prehistoric marine reptiles, um, different than turtles, but we are looking at the plesiosaurs, the mosasaurs, uh, the pylosaurs, ichthyosaurs, 
um, way back from prehistoric uh, fossil, you know, um, era. And so we do get reports and have had reports of creatures that are, for our, our best description, we're going to call them plesiosaurs. So there is a creature in um, the Ontario area near Kingston, Ontario called Kingsey. Now Kingsey is supposed to be a plesiosaur type creature. Um, it has been witnessed many, many times in that area to the point where a, a reward was offered locally. This was back in the 1800s. And a, a reward was offered locally for the capture of this creature. So three boat captains decided they would come together and work together to try to capture the creature. So one boat captain's idea was he would build this, do, um, this very large um, cage, um, think massive dog kennel um, or dog crate, that they were going to pull this huge creature up. They were gonna get lines attached to it, pull it up and put it into this cage and that way they would be able to sail around to different ports and put it on display. Only problem with this is generally if a, a creature is aquatic and it's of a, you know, the same size as a, a boat, um, it's not going to do very well pulled out of the water because it loses that buoyancy and it, it will essentially suffocate um, with all that weight being, you know, brought down on its lungs and its heart. So I don't know how long the creature would have actually lasted in this crate. But there, you know, so we have one boat, boat captain who has this big crate on the deck of his ship. And they're going to, you know, somehow get the, the creature into this crate. But how are they going to catch it? You know, what means are they going to use? So the other two boat captains decided they would sail around to different ports, different breweries, and they would get all the used hops and mash and, um, you know, uh, alcohol that, you know, was spoiling. They would get, you know, they would get all this and then they would dump it into the bay around Kingston, Ontario, in hopes that they would get the creature drunk enough that it would just surface and it would um, not put up too much of a fight as they, you know, pulled it into this uh, cage system and took it around making money off of it. Um, never, they were never able to, to catch it, but I can only imagine the, uh, the, the, chaos and pollution that that much uh, mash and hops and stuff like that uh, probably created in this area and was for a long time, um, you know, probably there and just uh, probably the fish were drunk, probably anyone swimming in the water was drunk. And so we, you know, we look at the methods that some people used in the olden days to catch things and it's like, well, that, that, you know, was worth a try. Um, we also have a creature in Lake Erie called, well, there's Bessie and then there's South Bay Bessie. Um, South Bay Bessie is a little bit more of a, I think, marketing um, uh, opportunity for different businesses. But we do have a, a plesiosaur report and they call her Bessie, um, kind of a, a tie-in with Nessie from Loch Ness. Um, we also have Pressy up in Lake um, uh, Superior, but it should be noted that the sightings of Bessie have been all around uh, Lake Erie, including Sandusky area, um, ports in New York, ports in Ontario. But the most interesting report is there was actually a pastor his wife and one of their churchgoers, they were having a prayer meeting in the churchgoers backyard and they saw what they assumed was an overturned boat um, being brought into shore by the waves. And so they, they were very alarmed that a, a ship had, had wrecked or overturned. And so they were calling for help, calling for help, um, you know, they were right near the lake shore trying to, you know, see if there was any um, survivors, if there was anybody out in the water that needed rescue. They're yelling for help. And all of a sudden, uh, the what they thought was the overturned boat 
starts to rapidly go back out into the water. But at this point, they can see that flippers are propelling it. And they suddenly realize that they are eyewitnesses to Bessie and that they're yelling for help and all the commotion that they caused had disturbed it. And so it went swimming back out into the um, depths of Lake Erie and they, they were not able to see it again. But Lake Erie has some, some other interesting creatures in it. Um, I'll take a little segue right here um, because there's actually what they call the sea hag. And this is from Seneca uh, Native American legends. And it said that the, the, the sea hag, um, she's green and she has poisonous skin and fingernails and that she causes the storms on the lakes and or on that particular lake, Lake Erie. And that when she, she captures um, any sailors, she keeps them and she keeps the shipwrecks. Now there's two reasons that I mention um, this uh, sea hag that's of Seneca legend. And that is because we have this enormous algae bloom that happens in Lake uh, Erie uh, every year. And it's very toxic, it's very poisonous, and it makes, uh, it kills the fish that are, are swimming in that area. Um, pretty much kills everything um, in that area. If you can't swim in it, you definitely wouldn't drink or eat anything that came from it. So this could tie in with the sea hag report that has been um, you know, told throughout Seneca Native American legends. Um, the also, the, the same reason that I mentioned this creature is this is in Lake Erie, which is our most shallowest of Great Lakes. And there was a ship called the Bess Bessemer Marquette number no. two, a ship almost the size of a football field, all metal ship, it, haul it was known for hauling Car, our train ferries. This ship went down in modern times in the early 1900s and is still missing to this day. So if a ship of that size can go missing in our shallowest Great Lake, then it's pretty hard for us to ever expect to find or catch any of these lake monsters because at no point in our lifetime will any of the Great Lakes be drained enough so that we would actually know what was living you know, in the depths of the lakes. So my last category that I like to talk about with our, our lake monsters here in the Great Lakes is what I call the amalgamations. Now these creatures are mostly of Native American legends, but they have a rich tradition in our maritime history. And so I do like to talk about them because they are some of the most interesting um, legends, stories that I have come across. And I love to share them with people because uh, you never know, you know, what somebody else might have experienced or will experience in the future. So I just like to give people some, uh, some interesting stuff to work with. So the first one I'm going to talk about is a creature called Carcagna. Now, Carcagna is part of the Mike Finn tall tales. Now, Mike Finn was a um, legendary tall tale um, similar to Paul Bunyan, Johnny Appleseed, Babe the Blue Ox, um, the, you know, the stories that helped build America, so to speak. But Mike Finn was he was well known here in the Great Lakes area, but he was known for being kind of a storyteller himself, very much a, um, like to brag about all of his accomplishments. And he always liked to tell stories of how he was the strongest guy there was and he could out wrestle any creature, any man, any beast, and he could win. And so on this particular night, and talking about how, oh, he, he beat a bear in Upper Michigan, and he wrestled a moose over in Wisconsin, and, you know, he's never met a creature that he couldn't take down. And so a stranger steps up to the bar and says, well, if that's the case, boy, do I have a beast for you to take on. So the stranger proceeds to tell them of Carcagna and how Carcagna is this water dragon monster 
that is swimming his way down from, you know, the, the um, different swamp areas. And he's, he's swimming in and out of different uh, marshes and swamps along the, the coastline of the, of um, the lake. And it would be great if Mike Finn could just rope out there and, and beat this creature senseless and, and make it, you know, stay away from all the port cities. And so Mike Finn, of course, agrees because, hey, he can take on anything. So with a little bit more, you know, chump, you know chest thumping and, and a couple of more alcoholic drinks, Mike Finn decides he's going to go out and he's going to meet this creature. Because according to the stranger, this creature should be passing by the, you know, the harbor that they're in that very night. So Mike Finn gets out into his rowboat and he goes out, you know, into the harbor and out into the bay. And his friends are all like, okay, now everybody line the coastline so that, you know, one mile in each direction. So if he rows back in, we catch him in his lie and we can, you know, we can, you know, have this on him. So that's what his friends do. They all line, you know, the, the coastline for about a half mile on each side. And they wait from the, the, the moment he leaves the pier till early the next morning. And as the sun's coming up, they realize, well, hmm, nobody's, you know, send up a call that they've caught Mike. And we wonder what's going on. So they all go back into the, the port. They go down to the fishing piers and they're kind of all waiting around like, well, Mike's not here either. Neither is his boat. So as they're all talking about it and, and trying to figure out what you know the plan should be, somebody spots a small vessel on the horizon of, of, the, of the lake. So they wait a little while and except for wave activity, the boat doesn't really seem to be doing anything. So finally, curiosity gets the better of some of them and two gentlemen jump into a boat that one of them owns and it's, it's motor powered, powered. So they go out and they get to the small boat and the people on the pier can see that they are towing this boat back in. And it isn't until they get within earshot that the people on the pier start hearing the two men in the boat yelling, get the doctors, get the doctors. And so once they realize what they're yelling for, a bunch of people burst off. They go out and they, they get to the doctor. The doctor comes back and meets them on the, on the, the fishing pier. And so they, they tie up the boats and they're like, what's wrong? What's wrong? And they're like, it's Mike Finn. Well, what's wrong with him? Well, look at him. And they're like, well, where is he? he? And they point to Mike Finn's rowboat. And they see Mike is curled up in a ball in the bottom of his boat. So the doctor and a couple of his friends get him out of the boat and they're here you know, to get him on land to get medical treatment. And Mike is pretty much catatonic. He is just not the, he's not the same Mike Finn that rode out the night before. So everybody's in astonishment. Nobody knows what, you know, what happened until one of the guys who, who is looking for answers jumps into, the, into Mike's robo and he picks up what is a black and yellow slimy feather. Now this ties into the description of Carcagna with him being black with yellow feathers, um, oily, slimy in appearance. Uh, he had wings and he had these different spiky protrusions of feathers going down his neck, down to his tail. But it was said, and this was something that the stranger left out of his, his um, mention of Carcagna. It said that whoever encounters Carcagna goes crazy. So with the ending of that tale, Mike Finn definitely lost against Carcagna that night. And, but we don't ever see Carcagna resurfacing at any point in any of the legends, just in the Mike Finn legends. Now there are um, three other uh, creatures that I'm gonna talk about as, as we have time. Um, the next one is Gassendia. 
Now, Gastendia is what they say is a blue flamed meteor dragon. And it's said that it will bounce across the surface of the water and then dive down into the depths. And it's been spotted on several different occasions. It was first reported by the Seneca India tribe. And they reported it as, you know, this snake-like creature that was able to dive into the water, come back out, fly across the surface of the water, dive back down. And it was always covered or always surrounded with this blue, um, bluish flame. Um, it seemed to have an orangish body and they named it Carcagnia, or I mean, uh, they named it Gassendia. Now, it was also reported by the French explorer Jacques Cartier, and when he was speaking with the Seneca Native American Indian tribes, they were telling him that this creature is what they call Gassendia. Um, so we do know that it was reported by at least two different um, groups of people with the Seneca Native American tribes and also uh, the French explorer Jacques Cartier and his group as they were making their rounds doing fur training. Now, the third creature that I'm going to talk about in this category is one called Onir. Now, I've come across two different reports for Onir. Um, he is either described as a serpentine, um, lizardy type creature, uh, what we would probably call a dragon, um, red and purples in colors. That is one report of him, but there's another report of him um, up around Lake Ontario area that says that this is a, um, almost like a demon type creature. It has the head of a wolf. It has the um, body of a flying lizard and it's said to bring gale force winds with it whenever it's seen. And it's believed that it does um, try to cause a lot of different uh, lake um, storms and gale force storms. And a lot of this activity is blamed on a creature called Onair. So two, you know, the same name, but two very different creatures um, but the, the activity that they create with the lake is very much the same. So um, it could just be what, what one person sees is different from what another person sees uh, when they're reporting this creature. So now the, the final creature that I'm going to talk about in the amalgamations character or um, category is actually from Lake Superior. Now, I, I want people to get into the right mindset with this. And so I always tell people the story of Inabishu first. And then I, I like to take you through a little imagery um, of what I think was probably the source story behind Inabishu. So Inabishu, according to Ojibwe legend, Actually, there are 50 different pronunciations and spellings of Inabishu's name around Lake Superior, depending on what Native American tribe you're talking to. But essentially, this is the great underwater panther or lynx that everybody um, attributes to Lake Superior. Now, the great underwater panther, Inabishu, is always the mortal enemy of either the Thunderbirds or the Thunder God, and is always um, responsible for causing all the, the um, destruction on the lakes with the storms and um, just the, the very um, uh, hostile, you know, uh, wave activity that we know Lake Superior for. But the description of Inabishu is a dragon type creature or a panther type creature, either with the head of a, of a um, lynx or, or mountain lion type creature, or the head of a horse or a moose, has horns coming out of its head on both sides, has spiky protrusions coming down its neck and over its back, 
has a long tail with spikes on the end of it, sometimes has wings, sometimes doesn't, has a slimy seaweed type mane, and the, the front legs of it are said to come down into claw-like um, uh, feet, um, usually wrapped with seaweed and, and stuff like that. The back legs are usually never seen because that part of it's still underwater. And it's a huge creature, very immense, um, very capable of taking down a, a long dugout canoe. So I always like to put people in this mindset. So imagine you're one of these early French fur traders or Native Americans, and you're traveling the lake in a dugout canoe. Now, these canoes are long. They're about 50 foot. and they are about as wide uh, as any tree that you can find, but they're not very deep. They're, they're, they're actually very shallowy dug, and you don't really want to take them out in deep water. They're good for along you know, the shoreline. But knowing that Lake Superior is very volatile, you wouldn't really want to go out deep into the lake in one of these you know, canoes anyways. You would probably stick you know, along the shoreline, probably taking as as direct a line as you could, unless you actually had to cross the lake and then you're gonna to try to find the shallowest part of the lake to cross a, you know, by. So imagine you're paddling along, you're maybe 15, 20 feet from the shoreline and all of a sudden this creature explodes up out of the water. And it's thrashing around, uh, sees you, sees your canoe, tries to, to topple your canoe, uh, you're trying to paddle like crazy to get away from it. It gives pursuit for about 10 feet, and then it seems to disappear back off, um, either under the water or, um, you know, you don't know where because, quite frankly, you're trying to get away from it. So I actually found out this information when I was writing my first bo book on lake monsters and odd creatures of the Great Lakes. And I confirmed it with different biologists, different DNR officers, and um, experts of this creature. So moose can actually dive up to 20 feet underwater to eat the underwater um, plants, seaweed, because it has a different nutrients than stuff on, on land has. Um, but they can dive up to 20 feet underwater. They do this by sealing their noses shut and using all their weight to dive down, grab a couple of mouthfuls of uh, whatever um, seaweed or, or um, you know, underwater plants that they can grab. They float back up, eat, you know, what they want, and then they, they can do this several times, and then they just swim back onto shore. And this is also a good way to get parasites off of themselves um like fleas um you know different types of uh bugs so diving underwater you can definitely get those off and and you know kind of get rid of them off of yourself um ticks are another you know different thing but imagine you are just paddling along trying to get from point a to point b and this moose pops up out of the water next to you and tries to destroy your your canoe as you are just trying to make your your day-to-day -day life. So I do believe that is part of the story behind Inabishu, um, where his origin story may have come from, was moose doing this behavior. And we also know that moose can do this because there have been carcasses of moose found in orcas. Now, we know that orcas don't come onto land and walk around. They might, they might be able to propel themselves up onto shoreline to grab things like penguins or seals or walruses, but they don't really come onto land and walk around. So that means at some point the moose was in the water, either swimming across um, you know, a bay or a, a lake, and the orca thought, huh, free meal. Um, we do know that there's no orcas in the Great Lakes area. But still, um, if moose can do it in one part of the world, they can do it in another part of the world. So um, very interesting uh, you know, fact there. Now the third or the last creature that I want to talk about 
he really doesn't fall into any of the five categories. He's actually kind of in his own category of his own, and he actually should. And so this creature is called Manitou, which means spirit in Native American, Nibinibis. And he is a mermaid or a merman type creature that has been reported in Lake Superior. Now, I don't want you to think Aquaman, um, Jason Momoa, um, totally not the, the, the right picture for this. Um, think more of a small child size humanoid that's part fish, part human, kind of brown and furry um, on the human half and definitely scales and, and fishy on the lower half. And he said to like to swim around the Pie Island area in Lake Superior, which would be up towards the northwestern um, part of Lake Superior, kind of more towards the, the Canadian side. But the legend goes that there was a Native American woman who was guiding some French fur traders as they were going around to different ports, um, trying to trade their, their furs to um, different tribes, different um, you know, French English settlements. And so they had decided that they would set up camp on Pie Island. And as they are pulling the canoes in on shore and kind of fastening them down and making sure that everything's, you know, um, you know, set on, on the canoes, the Native American woman witnesses something, you know, swimming out into the water. And as her eyes, you know, start to focus on, well, suddenly the men start to focus on it. Now, at first they think it's a beaver. So they're going to shoot it. And she's telling them, no, no, this is, this is very, very bad. Even seeing this creature is bad. And so she finally gets them to put down their guns and just leave it alone. Um, you know, we, we need to get inland as fast as possible because this is a very bad sign. And so after arguing with the men for several minutes and she basically taking their guns from them, they realize that the creatures dive down under the water and it's gone and, you know, they, they aren't going to be able to shoot it. And so she tells them that was the God of the Great Lakes. And because we have seen him, he is going to send a storm to destroy us. And so she is going straight into the middle of the island. Um, she told the men, it's up to you to save yourselves. So they all get into the middle of the island. They make, you know, a shelter for, for um, their camp. And then for the next three days, the skies open up and it is one of the worst storms that the Native American has, or a woman has ever seen in her life. And she tells them, this is what happens when you see the God of the lakes and you try to take his life. He will end yours. So it said that after that, they are very respectful and they don't go looking for him, but they definitely uh, learned their lesson from trying to provoke or kill um, the God of the lakes, Manitou Nibinibis. Um, so that is my, my final uh, creature that I'm going to talk about tonight. And we've got about 10 minutes or so. Um, I saw some questions popping up um, on the chat thing. So um, I will turn it back over uh, and we will go through the questions. Okay, um, go ahead and enter your question in the chat. I don't see any yet, but I don't know. They might've sent some directly to you as oh, well. I, I, saw, I saw some that were, were popping up, but I was- Some uh, of it might've been they, from me. Seconds and then they, they disappeared. <laughs> so go ahead and enter it in. Um, I'll, I'll start us off with one. Do you have um, a favorite lake creature that you like to research or learn more about? Oh, see, I'm always, I'm always after plesiosaurs. Um, I'm actually leaving in two days for Lake Champlain and uh, I'm, I'm gonna be on the, the New York side and the Vermont side. And so our, our hope is with the team expedition that we will get some evidence of him. Um, I know for at least two of the days, I'll be out in my kayak on the lake, um, trying different underwater traps and, and things to record 
So um, I, I would love to find a plesiosaur living in today's world. Um, probably won't be the mammoth size of, of you know, um, imagination, you know, from 20 to 50 foot, but maybe something um, a little bit smaller, maybe about a six foot. So actually a plesiosaur could, because if you think of whales, um, they survive in all different temperatures of water. And we actually do know of at least a few plesiosaur species that were able to live in Antarctic um, temperatures because of the, the flat, the fat and the blubber that they actually have. So yes, they could actually live just like our turtles live here in the Great Lakes. Um, you know, we, we could possibly have a plesiosaur that, you know, might migrate down into the Lake Erie area where it's a more shallow lake, might stay a little bit warmer. Um, I wouldn't say anything would probably be in Lake Superior because we know that the depths of Lake Superior are, are um, cold enough that bodies do not deteriorate. They don't bloat. They don't um, decay at all. So I, I would think that it would be in a little bit, you know, warmer water. He also asks, uh, what do you think of Bigfoot Sasquatch sightings in northern Michigan? So, yes, we, we do have Bigfoot, or, uh, a little bit off topic, but yes, we do have Bigfoot in Sasquatch. They're not just in northern Michigan. They're not just in the UP. We do actually have them lower down here in the state. Um, there are lots of reports from the um, Pinckney area, um, Pinckney-Hamburg area of the state parks there, um, where people have heard different growls, different um, vocalizations coming out of the woods. Uh, there's actually some BF, BFRO reports from that area. And so, yes, we do have Bigfoots and Sasquatch. Um, they're not just limited to the UP or to upper Northern Michigan. They're actually, um, they're actually all over the United States. There's, there's not really any one state um, that's devoid of them. Mm. Okay, um, so one, your concern for newer invasive species, um, and then he's uh, both and look prehistoric. Mud puppies are ugly. I've caught both. They're prevalent. Subjects for exaggeration. So I, I actually think the mud puppies are actually kind of cool looking. I do know that the bowfin um, is, um, I believe that is the one that a couple of years ago there was a taxidermist who turned it found a bowfin carcass. He uh, was trying to create something cool for a taxidermy show. So he actually turned it into a lake monster. And then um, some people thought it really was a lake monster and they bought it from him and were touring around the United States with it, claiming that it was a baby um, plesiosaur that had washed up on shore and until some research was done and it was actually shown that you no, know, it was a taxidermy uh, creation. Any other questions? In the meantime, I'll also post a link to our um, evaluation form that you can open. Okay. And I'll send that in the follow-up email too, as well as any other links that um, have come up. Um, Teddy asked if you have any good links to pictures or maybe know of like websites. So a lot of um, the pictures and stuff like that uh, are from historical documents and their drawings. But I, I feature a lot of this in, um, I have illustrations that I did of my own that are in my Lake Monster book. Um, now I'm not a, a great artist, um, but, uh, they are, you know, my interpretations of what some of these lake monsters look like. And so there, there are pictures of, um, Carcagna, Gassendia, O'Neill, um, uh, Inabishu, the Stearns Bayou monster. There, there's depictions, of, um, that are my own hand drawings that are in my lake monster book. 
And I can, I'll include a link to that book as well in the follow-up okay. email. Any other questions before we wrap up? Bob says, thank you. This has been great. Thank you. An excellent presentation by a very skilled researcher. This was a first class introduction to these subjects and she tend to not lower any expectations by her breadth of knowledge. Well, thank you. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, I'll do my little closing speech um, and wrap up. Uh, okay. So thank you so much for sharing about the lake monsters and other odd creatures of the Great Lakes with us. Thank you all for attending tonight's program. We hope you enjoyed it. Please take a few minutes to tell us what you thought about this program in the short event evaluation linked in the chat. Uh, visit our website, www.howellibrary.org to discover more upcoming events from the Howell Carnegie District Library. Thank you everyone, good night. Thank you.